Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jeffrey Smith, and I'm your co-host for today's show, in which we will take stock of the most recent elections in Africa, including Kenya and Angola, both of which took place last month. Importantly, we will seek to identify best practices to protect democracy through the ballot box. We will do this by examining what rigging has looked like in the past, with examples like Uganda and the DR Congo, and what leaders are doing there to defend the vote in upcoming elections. We'll also take a look at Zambia, where last year's citizens, civil society leaders, the democratic opposition, and international partners united in common cause to protect the genuine will of the people. Thankfully, helping me to guide today's conversation in this jam-packed show are my colleagues, Mentate Mloshwa and Nick Cheeseman. Nick, how are you doing today? Good, Jeff. Looking forward to it. Fantastic. Uh, well, as a way of refreshing your memory, the Resistance Bureau focuses on the major threats to human rights in Africa and worldwide, while shining an important light on the enduring struggle for freedom. Our program features the leaders at the forefront of these critical fights, the activists and human rights defenders, politicians, journalists, as well as thought leaders and academics. And of course, we seek to build solidarity and networks among them. It is in this spirit that we are joined by a truly stellar panel today, and I'm confident speaking on behalf of our entire team to say that we are really humbled to share this space with you. So first, we have Honorable Martine Feulu, who is considered by many Congolese and international observers as the true winner of the DR Congo 2018 presidential election. Following the polls, data from the Catholic Church showed him as the overwhelming winner, and subsequent independent analyses arrived at the same conclusion. Today, Honorable Feyulu continues to lead DR Congo's political opposition and also serves as the chair of the Commitment to Citizenship and Development, which promotes democratic culture in the DR Congo. We are also joined by David Lewis, a Harvard and Oxford graduate who is an attorney, a law lecturer, and a human rights activist from Uganda. He serves as the Secretary General of Uganda's pro-democracy opposition, the National Unity Platform. David has been routinely arrested and harassed for his courageous work in the struggle for freedom, and he has continued to be among the region's leading voices for democratic reform. Third, we have, a, we have with us Aurea Mozinho, a progressive thinker and activist with deep roots in Angola's civil society and the broader feminist movement. Currently, she serves as the Global Policy Advocacy and Campaigns Coordinator at the Global Alliance for Tax Justice. Based in Luanda, Adiyev works at the intersection of research, movement building, and advocacy to further democracy and women's rights. Last but certainly not least is Laura Mitty. She joins our program once again, so welcome back, Laura. She is a highly regarded independent writer, activist, and commentator on African affairs. Laura has also been at the forefront of major efforts, especially in Zimbab uh, Zambia, rather, to defend and expand civic space, secure free and fair elections, and to curb corruption and the management of public resources. Our discussant today, joining us a bit later on, is Lise Reichner, a leading political scientist who has spent time in some of the countries we'll be discussing today, most notably Zambia. In a short while, Lise will help lead our Q&A session with our colleague, Nick. And as we are waiting for, are we still waiting for Mantade, Nick, or has she joined us? I think we're still waiting, so we're gonna have to kick on. Yeah, so let's let's kick it over to you and, and set the scene for us, if you could. Hi everyone, well, sorry you have to see me rather than Mentale. She's obviously a much more fabulous host. Uh, while we're waiting for her, we hope she'll join us soon. I'll kick off. And I'm pretty well placed to do so because as many of you will know, I wrote a book a little while ago called How to Rig an Election, which was all about the ways in which elections are manipulated around the world and more importantly, what we can do to fight back. Uh, the book starts with a couple of key claims that we then discuss. Today, more elections are being held than at any time in human history. Yet democracy is in a two decade long recession with major backsliding evident in all corners of the globe. The main reason for that is that authoritarian leaders have learned how to manipulate elections to stay in power. Instead of working to secure a fair process and an equal playing field, these leaders use regular polls as a device to legitimate their illiberal and often highly repressive regimes. Recently, this has led to a series of flaw polled across Africa, including, for example, controversial and flawed elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo and most recently in Angola, as well as repeated controversies in countries such as Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Kenya and more. Of course, though, not all elections are ultimately undermined. In the Gambia, in Nigeria, in Malawi, in Zambia, and I think I've got a fairly good record because I was in Malawi, I was in Zambia, and I was in Kenya for uh, the latest election. For example, 
opposition parties emerged victorious against stacked odds, even though their respective playing fields were anything but level. And of course, Kenyan viewers will be asking whether or not William Ruto counts as an opposition candidate and whether that counts as a transfer of power. We can discuss that in the Q&A if people want to. So what does this mean? Does this all imply that elections won by opposition parties are the gold standard of a free and fair process? Does it tell us about elections that are won by ruling parties? The standard for elections is pretty straightforward, the guarantee of a legitimate process, not the guarantee of results. Today, we are talking all about that, how to protect the legitimacy of the process, how we can make sure that the results reflect the will of the citizens and this promise of stronger democracies and growing nations. In other words, today is about how do we protect elections and ensure that the will of the people as it's expressed at the ballot box is what's read out when the Electoral Commission come to make their decision. Our panel is here to help us unpack these important issues. As the audience, you could share reflections through YouTube, Twitter and Facebook comment sections, and you can send us your questions via WhatsApp on this number, plus 263-77-623-8199. I'll read that again, plus 263-77-623-8199. Eight one nine nine. If you send us questions, there's a great chance that we'll be reading them out and putting them to our panel at the end of today's show. So please do so. Jeff, please draw on our panelists today and start the discussion. Great. Thanks so much, Nick, and for providing emergency double duty. Of course, as you said, you're very well positioned to do so. So so thanks for for stepping in at the last moment. And Audi, I'd, I'd like to come to you first because, as Nick was mentioning at the outset, last month in Golan's voted. In, in an election, uh, since then a highly scrutinized election. And we learned that the long ruling MPLA was declared the official winner by the narrowest of margins. Since then, uh, of course, parallel vote tabulation efforts have indicated that the opposition, UNITA, won. And this data formed the basis of a court challenge that was ultimately rejected. To your mind, we'd like to ask you, what does this tell us about Angola's electoral process? What does it tell us about its democratic institutions? And secondly, reflecting on the failure of that court challenge in particular, what perhaps could have been done differently to ensure a different outcome for those who contested the results? We'd love your thoughts on that. Thank you, Jeffrey, for having me. It's great to have Angola represented on this platform. We're usually left outside, so I'm very happy to be here and sharing some reflections. And I'd like to pick up where Nick left saying elections are about guarantee of legitimacy of the process and not necessarily in the results. We have seen in Angola, and the last elections have shown us again, that electoral processes have been undermined in this country over and over over the years. And we're getting to a stage now where this has become more flagrant to the population, where we have more, or we've had, and now it's tapering out, a more open contestation from citizens because at every step of the process, since the, the, since the law itself was, was created, the electoral law was created, we saw a violation of due process and even democratic principles. So what that, that says about uh, about the, our, the character of our democracy, I today I start to question myself if we have a democracy. When the results have to be forced onto people by the presence of strong persons of military in the streets, because the regime fears that people will take to the streets to contest, not be, uh, and the contestation wasn't that the MPLA won, the contestation was that the National Electoral Commission failed to publish, for example, the, the polling assembly, uh, the polling assembly results. And so to this day, it hasn't published the results per polling assembly. So we don't have an idea uh, or a transparent idea of what actually how the election went. So in terms of due process to guarantee that whatever results were, 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 were whatever the results were, whether they were giving a victory to the MPLA or UNITA, you, you have a clear indication that our, our democratic basis, our democratic principles have been thoroughly undermined. This leaves um, the obvious conclusion that we're living under an autocracy. Of course, we have to ask ourselves, well, do autocracies have, have elections? And in my analysis, yes, today we see the election instrument being used by a ruling autocratic party to legitimize its own um, staying in power, and not so much for us citizens. This is much for, as we say here, for the Englishman to see. This is for international um, appeasance. This is for international 
um, support and not and not not at all interested in you know what people might perceive as the legitimate as legitimate concerns or legitimate playing uh, legitimate questions as to how we arrive at the results. It is it is a, it is a tough situation for any opposition party. Uh, I personally wouldn't like to be in the skin of UNITA because uh, the question is not like you are going against a, a democratic regime with democratic institutions. The state and every institution that should be Republican, have, Republican has been captured by the MPLA. Uh, we have highly part, part, partisan institutions and we have a, a, a regime that is really willing to go to all means whatever to defend its staying in power. So as an opposition party, you either have to do what you need to do, which is ultimately accept the results after contesting through the legal means, or take people to the streets, encourage people to go to the streets and risk and risk a bloodbath. Uh, it is a very unfair position to judge, you know, whether it, they, they've made the, the right decision. Personally, I think for a country that has lived through so much war, um, it, it wouldn't be easy to then bear the cost of even one life being lost to a contestation on the street. Um, but I think the, the, the struggle, in a sense, continues. I think uh, the approach is to see this as a, as, a, as a very visible dent on the NPLA's reign. Let's remember that they, even in the results that, they, that the Electoral Commission has given them, they, they have 51%. And if we look at the trajectory that has been the MPLA losing 10 percentage points per election, we might be we might sit in a situation where in the next elections, if the MPLA doesn't do something outstanding uh, differently from what it's been doing, then we'll have an MPLA that won't be able to justify having any kind of majority. Thanks so much for that. I think it also chimes in an important way with some of the trends that we're seeing, right? I think we're going to see in countries like South Africa and Namibia, we've seen, you know, declining one party dominance and increasingly competitive elections. And then you get to see essentially, you know, ultimately, are you willing to give up power, right? When you actually get to the pinch, when you actually see the opposition going over 50%. And I think there's a lot of countries where we may see that kind of question being asked over the next four or five years as economic difficulties fuel growing discontent. So maybe we can put to you the kind of question you posed yourself at the end, which is, you know, going into the next election now, uh, first, you know, how do you see the ruling MPLA responding? Is this going to be a predominantly repressive response? Or might we, for example, start to see them trying to deliver more curb corruption, deliver more services in recognition that that's actually the only way to build back legitimacy? Um, and also, you know, what do you need to and other civil society actors now do? I think you pointed out very well that the difficult challenge, which is, do you go to the streets and risk a bloodbath or do you uh, accept the results begrudgingly, even though you know they were not acceptable? And of course, um, Falu, Martin Falu is coming up later. We'll talk about that as well, the decision he had to uh, take, uh, think about in the context of the Democratic Republic of Congo. But what do you see as the opportunity here now for UNITA and civil society building towards the next election to perhaps put some more building blocks in place to try and prevent this from happening again? Thank you, Nick. Uh, the challenge for UNITA will be maintaining the kind of support that they had from citizens in general in this election. This will be a challenge because five years, it's a very long time, many things can happen. And there's the possibility that the MPLA still being in power could, of course, you know, put in place policies and programs that, you know, that ease out the economic situation that the current the country is currently undergoing. I think that will not be possible. And here I wear my hat as an economist because we are also undergoing a very thorough uh, micro micro finance macro finance crisis. The, the 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 government has effectively no funds to finance any sort of buying of vote, voter buying. We are go undergoing a very serious restructuring, economic restructuring that will. Um, require the cutting, for example, of fuel subsidies. And we have a huge, huge urban contingent on young, of young people that depend on low fuel prices to work as, for example, border border riders, as taxi drivers, and so on and so forth. So if I can predict something, and, and, and you know, we'll probably be back here in five years and I'll be thoroughly wrong, but we'll see uh, the only way, we'll, the only way at least in the first years will be uh, an accentuation, an, an aggravation of the authoritarian drive. 
Uh, we've seen this. We've seen that the regime is willing to do this because of the presence of military in the streets. We have really strong presence and intimidation uh, through police and stuff. Many activists were arrested. So I don't think this will peter out if there's any attempt at uh, at a um, at a um, at a manifestation of dissent in the at least in the, in the coming months. Uh, but predicting five years into the future is really hard. Um, a lot of people have been unhappy with UNITA for going into parliament regardingly, as you said. Uh, so it will be the very difficult to regain that that confidence again. I think what we have now is an opening for civil society and UNITA potentially to start again making making deals and agreements and partnerships to really strengthen the, the the what we call the monitoring of the vote something remarkable that happened in this in these elections that really made it difficult for the mpla to still in places like luanda and the bigger cities uh, and that's the reason that, that, they, that they did not publish the the voting assembly lines is that young people stayed outside of the police stations waiting for the results, photographing the polling results, uh, some, the police summary results, sending to each other through to, to WhatsApp and to another platform that consolidated all of that, that got to count 5%, imagine, 5% of, uh, of the assembly votes uh, results. This is huge, given all the constraints. So, if this system, parallel county systems can be improved, I think we have a better chance of then through legitimate means and legal means and peaceful means uh, be able to contest uh, um, any you know, subversion of the people's will uh, in a better way. But let's remember, this is an autocratic regime. We are not dealing with the normal forces of justice and fairness and well, and good reason. So. The, the challenge is also striking a balance between, um, you know, this legal means and also the fear that any other any deviation from that can result in unnecessary loss of life. Thank you so much um, for your insights. I think I'd love to bring in Honorable Fayulu into the conversation because while we've had all of these concerns that you've brought forward. Uh, he's not a stranger to some of those concerns. You look at um, the 2018 elections in the DRC Congo, and you look at how it remains the most egregious cases of election rigging in our recent history. So, honorable for you, it stands that you effectively rigged out in favor of another opposition candidate who did a deal with the outgoing of the, um, president. So maybe give us a bit of context as to what really happened and how you've managed to deal with the tension between calling out the flawed election with your critical accountability um, responsibility to ensure peace in a country that yearns for stability. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what happened in the Congo, in the DR Congo, is this. Mr. Kabila, who was there for more than 18 years, didn't want to go. He wanted to come again and uh, to be a candidate for the third time while the, our constitution doesn't allow this because our constitution said uh, in the article 70 that uh, you can be president for five years and you can renew that only once for all. Uh, Kabila wanted, but the Congolese people said that it cannot come again. And we had demonstrations and also the international community backed us up and uh, Kabila couldn't. And Kabila sent a proxy, but that proxy was really, really, uh, because of Kabila, he couldn't do anything. And then he managed to discuss, uh, uh, to agree to sign a deal with another guy from the opposition, uh, uh, Mr. Chisekedi, who was with us. He, he, he uh, Chis Chisekedi was in the same team than myself, because we had a coalition, an opposition coalition called Lamuka, meaning wake up. And uh, just after I was chosen as a common candidate, Chisekedi left the coalition 24 hours uh, later on. And uh, then he started uh, um, agreeing with Kabila, uh, first of all, to be a prime minister. But at the end of the day, uh, we had the election on Sunday, uh, 30th 
um, December uh, 2018, uh, when we had that election and the people voted for number four, this is me, and uh, the massive vote, we had uh, the voting machine. But with the voting machine, we have agreed that uh, the vote should be manually counted. And, but that machine had also the way to transmit the result directly. What they did, and uh, they at 9 a.m. on Monday, they had almost 70% of the result, but at that 70%, they realized that I won. And uh, with the remaining result, they couldn't do anything, even if they gave everything to one of the opponents. And uh, at that time, they decided to, uh, you know, try if they can, um, you know, change the result. They tried with uh, many ways, by many ways they couldn't. And they decided uh, with Kabila to just fabricate a result. When people, were continuing to count the ballot, the, uh, you know, uh, they just uh, change the figures. Uh, in the first instance, Mr. Kabila wanted his guy, uh, his proxy uh, to win, but the discussion among themselves, uh, you know, uh, tried to push him to accept Mr. Chisekedi because his people told him that, okay, look, if you take uh, Mr. Your, your proxy, uh, it will be very difficult because uh, Fayulu's Lamuka team and the Chisekedi, which is a UDPS team, they will uh, be together. That will be more than 80% of the uh, voters. They will come and the demonstration will be, uh, you know, we cannot. Uh, you know, contain the demonstration. That's why they convinced Mr. Kabila to uh, point uh, Chisekedi. But when we got the election, people knew that I won. And some people in the, in the Congo, uh, they came to see us, to tell us, you guys, you have won. But before you were with uh, Chisekedi and the Kamere, can't you now? as you won, everybody knows the result. This was on uh, the, the, the uh, uh, January 2nd. They said, can't you agree that you bring your, your friend, your former friend, come and uh, you offer them the uh, job of prime minister? We said, this, we were together. We can still come again together. And, uh, we agree on that uh, meeting at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, but at that 5 p.m., Mr. Kamere, who was supposed to come to meet with us, didn't show up. At that time, they were called to Mr. Kabila's office and uh, the Mr. Kabila ranch, and uh, they have agreed, they made the deal uh, to push uh, Chisekedi. That's, that's what's happened. What's really happened was the um, rig started with the number of voters. They come up with 40 million voters, but they had already 10 million were the, the, the fake voters. But at the day, the date of the day of the election, the uh, guys, some guy in the electoral commission, they did a good job. What they did, they prevented those uh, fake, uh, um, you know, um, voters. Their vote didn't come into the system. That's why they couldn't have the real figure. Out of uh, uh, 39 million uh, voters, uh, they proclaimed the result for only 18.3 million, even less than the number of voters in 2011, seven years before we had 18.9 million voters. You know, the thing is, they started with the electoral list. They had 10 million. 
they try to put the voting machine, the voting machine so they can, and they took some voting machine, they gave to our own people so they can use those, those 10 million fake voters to put it into the system. But they couldn't, that's why uh, they didn't succeed. At the end of the day, they just uh, fabricate uh, results. But the other question you said, how I try to manage to tell people not to go uh, to the street or, you know, we didn't tell people to go to the street because we didn't, uh, you know, think about that uh, because we thought with our co coalition, the coalition Lamuka in English wake up uh, was asked by the Congolese. The Congolese told us, okay, you guys look, uh, you know, give us one candidate, a common candidate, and you'll see what we will do. Has, and then the common candidate was chosen on November 11, only 13 days before starting the campaign. And we didn't have time to organize ourselves to say, if someone steals the election, you guys go to the street. And we knew that we will win at do whatever you want, we will win. That's why uh, we didn't uh, organize ourselves to send people to the street, on the street. But when they, we realized that they have uh, fabricated the, the figure, and we said that Kabila was ready to shoot. He was ready uh, to you know, have a massive killing and then to charge us. By the way, what he, uh, when the Catholic uh, bishop had the result, what Kabila uh, did on uh, you know on the third on the fifth on the fourth, he called the bishop in his farm, telling them, telling them that yes, I know that you have results, but you are if you want the blood in this country, please go ahead and publish the, those results. And the bishop were afraid, you know? That's why we, for example, we ourselves, we said that, okay, we know that we won, but we will find a way uh, to, um, you know, uh, our people uh, that, uh, uh, you know, to, to continue uh, to to uh, for five years later, or even not five years, but we wanted to push with the uh, um, uh, African Union and the other organization to have a, a an election eighteen months uh, later. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Fayulu, for that. You know, obviously, the the DRC case in twenty eighteen is is quite unique uh, on the African continent insofar as it was rigged in favor of another opposition leader, as as you have laid out. And I think that's important for people to know. But aside from the, the domestic issues that you've just laid out for us and, and the problems therein, you know, in most countries that have experienced rigged elections like DR Congo, an all too frequent aspect that we have seen, the, the, the betrayal often comes also from the international community, right? Where, where they're failing to stand up for and, and call out the fraud as they see it. So we wanted to ask you really quickly in, in, in two minutes, you know, what is your message to Congo's development partners and also global leaders who have an authority and a voice on elections, those who seem to really hold African elections to a lower standard? You know, as, as we see it too often, democracy in Africa is sacrificed on this altar of so-called security and stability. We hear this over and over again. So we wanted to know, you know, really briefly from you, what are the consequences of this approach and what will you and your colleagues be, be doing between now in December 2023 to defend the integrity of your next election and also to avoid a repeat of what you've just described uh, that happened in 2018. Yeah, to answer your question, I will start with uh, what President Biden said. Uh, President Biden said this quote, democracy uh, or defending democracy uh, demand a whole of society effort. It requires all of us. I totally agree with him that all of us, the all countries, the democratic countries has to work to help Africa. 
on other continent countries to be in democracy. But if you don't do so, uh, what you will have, uh, you will have uh, uh, those uh, guys who don't have any legitimacy continue to run the country. They will run the country as they want. And then um, you will have uh, corruption, you will have uh, uh, no um, you know, development in the country. In the country like Congo, they will deal with uh, those who don't have uh, a sense of democracy. And like now, right now in the Congo, uh, we, they call us a solution country. Solution country, why? Because we have forest, we have mining, mine, um, you know, uh, but people, they will just try to uh, sell all those, uh, um, you know, forests, um, mine as they want, because they don't have anything to do with the, uh, the country. Then what we are asking the country like the US to impose sanction right now, when they see that the process, people are trying to derail the process, they have to intervene and say that, okay, you guys will sanction you because we want a free, fair, and impartial election. So we can uh, protect the whole world uh, because uh, today you see in the Congo uh, full of corruption, everywhere corruption. Why? The country is in the bad condition, insecurity, people are suffering. We have a three uh, quarter of the population living in poverty, below poverty, uh, you know, uh, standard. Thank you so much, Honorable Feilu. So, uh, yeah, David. Yeah, I, yeah, but you let me continue because you said what we have to do, yes. what we have to do. What I did, I wrote uh, a letter to the AU on Jan on February uh, 2018, asking the AU that you guys, you have to come here and uh, to discuss with all stakeholders so we can sit down and to have either you recount the ballot paper or we organize another election in, let's say in 18 months. They didn't respond. Every year in uh, February, I keep sending letters to AU. But then on May 10th, 2019, I wrote a letter, an open letter saying that, okay, this is my proposal to get out of this crisis. What we have to do, we have to create a commission. That commission will take care of reforms. Let's do reforms, institutional reform on the electoral commission, electoral law and so on. So for the next election, we can have a comprehensive electoral law and we can have a uh, accepted electoral commission by everybody. All this didn't happen. But we, as a Lamuka coalition, we went ahead, we made those reform and we sent to everybody. Today, they had an electoral commission comprises with Chisekedi's guy. So the, 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 the 15 of them, they are from Chisekedi, including, including those who yeah, he took from us, but he paid them, he took from us and from the other uh, 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 political uh, parties. Now, what he did, he appointed a uh, judge in the constitutional court. The constitutional court president is from Chisekedi's party. The guy in the uh, electoral commission is from Chisekedi party. Chisekedi has tried to, uh, you know, put in every level, including the Minister of Finance, Minister of uh, Justice, Minister of the, the, um, the um, Governor of the Central Bank, everywhere they are Chisekedi's guy to rig the ne next election. But what we are doing, I'm touring the country, I've toured the country to tell everybody that 
in 2023, in 2023, nobody can steal, will steal your uh, vote. If somebody attempt to do so, all of us, all of you on the street and the people are prepared uh, for that. Thank you so much, Honorable Feyu, for that. Um, you know, David, we, we thought it'd be really great to, to turn to, you know, you heard Honorable Feyu describe how the election was, was effectively stolen in DR Congo, how it was uh, allowed to happen uh, essentially by, by the international community. And I'm sure as, as you were sitting there listening and as many Ugandans tuning in today were listening, you know, they, they heard a, a very similar story. And, and many could plausibly argue that Uganda's 2021 election was perhaps just as bad. So we wanted you to, to walk us through your experience in Uganda. Specifically, why do you, uh, many Ugandans, and, and surely many of your supporters believe to this day that Bobby Wine is the rightful president of the country? What evidence was in fact collected to demonstrate that fraud took place to allow Museveni to remain in power to this day? Thank you very much. Um, I hope I'm uh, uh, loud and clear. Um, I uh, thank you so much for organizing this uh, very important platform, and I'm very glad to uh, meet uh, all of you uh, online. Uh, you know, um, uh, comrades who have uh, gone through similar situations, uh, sitting here indeed and listening to what uh, went on in uh, the DRC, you could tell that maybe that was a replica of what exactly happened in Uganda. What I can say is that uh, there are no elections in Uganda. It's just a facade. It's just uh, something else because you know at least in some places there's an attempt to show that elections were free were fair and maybe they fidget with the numbers and that kind of thing but in uganda general seven clearly shows you that uh, elections mean nothing and so uh, we had an election or, or so-called election where you know uh, first of all the campaign period was full of violence uh, while Museveni and his people are campaigning we're not allowed to carry out campaigns, uh, although the law in Uganda allows you to consult, to carry out consultations um, uh, as you head towards the presidential election. General Seven effectively banned those, and uh, uh, Bobby Wine, our presidential candidate, was not allowed to do any such consultations. And of course, in the lead up to the election, there was uh, a lot of violence, uh, people being uh, intimidated, harassed. Uh, our presidential candidate or aspirant at the time, Bobby Wine, was. Uh, I don't know, arrested so many times uh, before uh, 2021. Um, our people shot dead, targeted in all manner of ways, so as to create a sense of fear amongst the people. And so when, uh, you know, the, the voting day uh, came, it was clear what the regime had already prepared to do. They were not ready to accept any other result. Although the people of Uganda were making it clear that they wanted change uh, from this uh, 36 year uh, rule, of General Museveni and his people. Um, you will remember that at the time, uh, General Museveni conveniently used COVID-19 to crack down. And while it was okay for his people to carry out rallies, uh, his party, the NRM, had uh, primaries where thousands of people would gather uh, and they would ferry crowds like they normally do, pay people to come for these uh, events. When it came to our party, the NUP, they would tell you, oh, you're going to, to spread COVID-19. Yeah, so so then, then they didn't allow us to do a lot of campaigning. And also, also towards uh, the end of the campaigns, when they realized that wherever uh, Bobby Wine was going, he was attracting thousands of people, they blocked him. They now said uh, the Minister of Health somehow came up with numbers to show that in some districts, including uh, the capital city and others, that the COVID-19 uh, numbers were going high. So then they said, no, no, no campaigning in these uh, places. But of course, if you come during elections and radio stations, uh, people, Bobby Wine was pulled off radio stations a number of times, uh, as, as you all remember who are following the events. Um, just um, towards elections, his entire campaign team was picked up, the entire team that he was moving with, and they were taken to prison. Uh, over 100 people initially that were arrested, and then uh, there was screening, so his security team, campaign team, they say that all the uh, over 40 people had been found and three bullets people and charged them before the military court and kept there some for seven months, eight months, and some are still there as I speak two years after the election. 
So what happens in Uganda cannot be called an election. Uh, of course, you must, I'm sure people have been following, uh, many must have seen the levels of ballot staffing that took place. So General Museveni employs different mechanisms depending on which area uh, he's looking at. In the remote areas, the military simply takes over, does ballot staffing, takes over the election, and then uh, at the end of the day, uh, they, they declare themselves. So ballot staffing, uh, you know, people go to polling stations and they are told that uh, you can vote for member of parliament, but for the president, that election has already ended. And then if you look at the official results issued by the electoral commission, um, you'll find General Seven claiming to have won with 100% at so many polling stations uh, in, in the countryside. So we deployed polling agents, but many of them were arrested. Uh, supervisors for uh, constituencies, parishes, whatever, were picked up. And up to now, uh, some of them are still in detention. And of course, when they're arrested, they are charged with all manner of uh, offenses, some related to elections, but many are related to other funny things, inciting violence, threatening violence, and that kind of thing. Of course, Genome 7 in this particular election, 2021, blocked international observers. Uh, you remember the US was not able to observe the election because they refused to give them accreditation. The European Union, the same thing, they claimed that uh, these were promoting neocolonialism and whatever, and so blocked international observers uh, from observing the election. They did not stop at that. They, you know, uh, deported several uh, international journalists. And of course, uh, the local journalists, many of them are on the run. Some of them are in exile as we speak uh, today, simply because they are doing their work. Some, of course, were targeted on the campaign trail. Um, a young man called Ashraf Katsiri nearly lost his life because was hit with a projectile on the head and, and, and that was a fate of many other people. Um, of course, in, immediately after the elections, because despite everything that uh, happened, people actually voted in protest against Museveni in many places across the country. Uh, the central region was clear, the eastern region. So General Museveni decided now to employ another uh, trick and that was to arrest people who were in possession of DRA forms. Uh, DR forms are forms which contain official results from polling stations. So as our polling agents were coming in with uh, these uh, DR forms, they were trailed, trailed, tracked down and abducted, um, beaten up and, uh, and, 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 and all manner of things done to them. Of course, many of them, like I said, ended up before the military court. And while all this was happening, the internet had been switched off, the entire internet, not just social media, because in the previous election, they, they were only switching off social media, but in this particular case, they switched out of the entire internet infrastructure and of course deployed uh, their people, uh, soldiers and all that everywhere, including at media stations. So journalists were not able, for those who are able to use VPNs to access Twitter, some people who put up tweets showing that uh, our presidential candidate Robert Chagulani was winning, they were immediately threatened and uh, they pulled down uh, those tweets. So. That is the kind of environment that we're operating in. So even with uh, many of the uh, people arrested, we collected some data forms. We did some computing under very, very uh, difficult circumstances because we were being hunted down um, by, by police, by the military, uh, plain clothes people. But our tally gave us 54.19% of the, of, the, of, the, of the, you know, uh, total vote. But that was excluding the data forms that had been taken away by the regime. And many of them up to now have never been returned. So that is the environment under which we operated. Uh, the context is not different from what uh, our comrade from uh, the DRS is talking about. The, you have General Museveni upon the entire electoral commission at will. The parliament is in his armpit. Uh, the judiciary, he has publicly said that he would appoint um, uh, cadre judges, what he calls cadre judges, uh, so he will get people who belong to his uh, party literally who profess um, support for him and put them in these positions. So even when we tried to, when we tried to file a case before the Supreme Court, it was extremely difficult because the Chief Justice then started giving all manner of excuses. Uh, they blocked us from filing many of the affidavits or the evidence that we had, you know, said we could not amend our petition to put more grounds and all that. And eventually we decided to withdraw that petition and place it before the people of Uganda. And that's what we've been trying to do, to rally the people of Uganda to reclaim their power through the people power movement.
Thank you so much, um, David. You've given a very, I think, clear picture of what's happening um, in Uganda, both in terms of what happens before the election, but also what happened to the election. And I think a greater part of what comes out is just how much of a restrictive environment it is, just by highlighting some of the ways in which the government was cracking down on both political parties, um, activists and citizens in general. So the first part of my question really is around what you are potentially doing right now to overcome this perversive fear that is being built by the sustained crackdown on citizens, on politicians, um, human rights activists. And then on the other side, just building on the input around budget staffing is one of the ways in which um, rigging occurred in Uganda. My question really is around how do you see yourselves making or building the confidence of citizens in the process, in the, in the, in the, in the election process, so that they're able to still show up for future elections? I must admit that uh, it's uh, extremely difficult um, to even imagine that you can, you know, take on seventy and 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 get a victory through elections. Right now, it's clear to us that uh, we only go for these elections to mobilize the people, to rally the people, to rise up, because with Museveni still in charge of our country illegally, you cannot. Because, like I said, in other places. There's a semblance, uh, at least some dictators try to put in place measures to show that elections are going on. We've had by elections, for example, in one ele uh, by election uh, in a place called Kayunga, we, we still have DRA forms. We collected all the DRA forms, giving us a, a 14,000 lead, uh, close 15,000 uh, lead over Museveni's um, candidate. But the Electoral Commission shamelessly went on and announced the NRA. And this has gone on in several other elections. So we have to go for this election. But if not, then what are the other? Um, Museveni does not have huge embarrassment to him. In the last election, people showed him clearly that they had rejected him. So I think whatever he's trying to do and his system is to try to discourage people from believing in democracy, from uh, believing in uh, the rule of law, from believing in any form of uh, democratic engagement. And we've been telling our people not to give up. We've been telling our people to continue uh, lawful, non-violent means we're doing currently. We're trying, uh, we're using this time to mobilize, to organize, to get to the grassroots, but most importantly, to reach out to our friends in the, in the international community to tell them that, look, you cannot uh, continue supporting a system that does not believe in the rule of law, that does not believe in democracy. Because General Museveni, like all uh, dictators, is really sustained by this support he gets in form of foreign aid and that kind of thing and also so we, we we have been saying that this should be withdrawn from him as i speak right now uh many of our young people have been abducted some of them we don't even know where they are right now you know we still have people are missing for two years who are abducted simply because they were either our candidates or they were found wearing bobby wine's t-shirt and that kind of thing so we think that the international community needs to come in and put an end. At least if they are not willing to do anything proactively, let them stop supporting the dictator in Uganda. So uh, while we try to engage locally, domestically, uh, our role has been to really continue encouraging the citizens to participate, uh, to do whatever they can. But we also think that the international community has a big role to play. Thank you so much, um, David. Laura, I'd like to turn to you now because I think we'd love to just shift towards a positive note and just highlight some of the lessons that we could potentially get um, from an election process that has worked. We give an example of Zambia offering a glimpse of hope for many across the continent. You also look at other success stories like the Gambia and Malawi that preceded the Zambia election. So my question to you is against this backdrop of widespread censorship, repression and intimidation, what steps did the opposition led by now President Hichinima and civil society groups take to protect the votes in the August 2021 general election? Thank you. Um, I must start by saying it's, it's very difficult to speak uh, after uh, the other panelists um, whose situation is very different from Zambia. It feels 
almost wrong because I'll start by saying that our circumstances, I think, are quite different. So one thing that can be said for Zambia is that a lot of stars are aligned in a way for what happened in August 21. But most of all, there are two, diff uh, two uh, factors that are very different. One, ours was a toddler dictator that never matured. An incompetent dictatorship that wanted to be a dictator but did not quite learn the ropes. Uh, because of that, there are certain things that happened in Uganda, for example, or, or Congo, that did not happen. So, for example, I suppose in, a, in, 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 in other countries, uh, uh, a lot of individuals that spoke up and managed to uh, bring mobilize their citizens were not as harmed as happened in other uh, countries. So, so, for example, we were arrested, yes, but it was two days in the cells. The worst that happened to you was you were sitting with fecal matter, but you came out with your bones intact. <laughs> Um, which allowed us, I think, to continue uh, working. So, for, for, so I think for that, I'd like to put that on record. That uh, I hope the other panelists don't feel that I'm saying to them, uh, in in a way, that there are things that they have not done because the 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 situation in most countries it is much harsher than we had to deal with. Another point I think is that Zambians have the muscle memory of removing governments, which other countries don't. So the PF forgot that. They forgot that Zambia had removed or turned, um, changed governments multiple times. And although they were looking cowed and kind of despondent, they held on, they held this card to their chest that says 12th August, come 12th August, we're going to turn out and vote. This is something that is not true again in, in other countries. And for us, as I think in Zambia, it's something that we have to also um, hold dear, that citizens should not forget the fact that they hold, um, they, have, they have real power over elected officials. So what we, what we have very weak in Zambia is what happens in between elections. Zambia is a very weak at holding governments to account in between elections and making sure that their democracy translates to, to services. But they seem to, to be very sure that nobody should sit in state house uh, without their consent. That said, in the period between 2011 and uh, 2021, Zambia's democracy really regressed. Uh, most of us were sitting in shock at, the, at, at what was happening. And I, I, and I will share the few things I think that helped to ensure that by 2021, a government that was very sure that it would not hand over power and, 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 and very clearly did not care about the results of the election was still removed. One I would say is that civic actors, especially, I, I, I would uh, credit the 2021 win to civil society more than even the opposition. The opposition for a long time was cowed. You know, like uh, uh, President Hichilema and his party uh, had been vilified, um, prevented from carrying out their work in such a way that I think left to themselves, they probably would not have been able to pull together. But because civil society uh, insisted on keeping his elbows out, like I like to say, and 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 uh, standing against a dictatorial government. When the time came um, for elections, the the opposition was able to ride on the back of what uh, uh, civil society had managed to do. Civil society. Uh, and in this is both organizations, I'm going to use this word broadly. So it was organization, individual civic actors like maybe uh, Pilato and others together played the long game. So we understood, I mean, like the organization I work for understood already in 2016, or at least decided that in 2016 that 2021 was going to be about the youth vote. So from 2016 to 2021, we worked quietly 
without anyone knowing, to turn out the youth vote. First of all, to make the youth understand that, um, to, under to understand why it was important to vote, to understand why what was happening was wrong, to not accept it. So that by the time uh, August 21 came out and they were coming out in mass, it wasn't just happening. There had been many years of meetings, of speaking to them, of social media work and all kinds of things. So they, they, it was systematic. And also we had some kind of um, what I would call the collision of the faithful. So we had different civic actors, civic groups, voices, each working to their strengths. So like the ACA, we worked with the young people. We did a lot of, 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 of um, loud, I suppose, loud advocacy, confrontational advocacy. We had other organizations who were maybe not so much out uh, in the forefront, but we're carrying out research to inform what we would say. You had uh, other like chapter one that carried out litigation. But what happened was civil society fought multiple battles that added up to winning the war. So there was Bill 10, which was huge. Uh, had we lost the issue, the, 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 the constitutional change, because uh, the PF had put just about all its eggs in, in, in the constitutional change, which was essentially going to hand them the election. At that time, much of the public did not understand what was so wrong about, about what with, with Bill 10 or, or the constitutional amendment, because uh, what the government had done was sweeten a poisonous drink and very well hidden uh the the evil in the bill it took the law association of zambia civic actors quite a while to convince the public how bad bill 10 was but once the public understood there was a groundswell of voices that resisted uh bill 10 and ensured that it did not pass what it did not pass once it did not pass the government was in its back foot and began now to try to openly rig the election and all kinds of things, but you could tell that they were very flustered because their trap card had had had, had someone been had been had been called up. So there was that. There was the issue of fighting against corruption. Um, there was the issue of keeping the civic space open. So whatever space was there, we kept working at it. We we did not cower. So, but again, like I say. Uh, the, 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 the consequences that Zambia has had to pay maybe were not as harsh as would be paid in a country like Uganda, but we, we understood that and, and uh, stood uh, in whatever spaces where they spoke on, used social media. Social media was huge. So we got to young people, got to people to, uh, uh, to, to understand why it was important to vote. After a while, you could see a change in the public. And I would say that this last election was the first for, uh, I think, in a long time. In fact, maybe in the history of Zambia other than independence, that was fought on issues. So when, when citizens were speaking, when young people were speaking, they were speaking about corruption, they were speaking about service delivery, they were speaking about the constitution, and they were saying that is, I mean, of course, there were issues like cadres, there were issues like the economy, but that took civic actors going on and on about these issues until they became commonplace. Debt was an issue, and as you imagine, debt in most countries is very technical, but civil society spoke about debt, simplified it, linked it to people's lives. And when the election finally came, I think the, the shock for the ruling party was how many citizens came out. I'm pretty sure, okay, so it is understood that the PF lost by 1 million votes. I think they lost by much more. So, but what their rigging was overwhelmed by the turnout of voters. So, if, you know, if you listened to the PF, kept saying we win by 500 voters, multiple uh, voices of the ruling party would say they would win by 500,000. It, it seemed like a magic number. So I think they had rigged up to 500,000, but there was more people that came out to vote and it was too late to do anything about it. And then there was, of course, the vote protection that the opposition party did. You know, before these elections, the opposition party had been really sloppy about protecting the vote. So my view is that the opposition, uh, UPND probably won both 2015 and 2016 votes, but vote protection was really, really weak then. This time they had uh, 
um, observers, their own observers uh, um, in each polling station, but also like I think um, Aurea said from you, uh, Angola, young people refuse to leave the polling booth. Uh, and, and, and the polling centers. And so they stood there to, ins uh, to ensure that uh, they, they tabulated the vote. And very early after elections, it was quite clear that, that uh, the PF was losing. Talking about the stars aligning, for some reason, government agreed to make each polling station a, a, a voting center. So at each polling station, the vote was counted and pasted at, at, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the door or whatever, publicly there. So voters had the figures before the, all the, the, the counting would be done centrally. So this time, because they agreed to that very quickly, it was clear that the UPND was winning. But overall, I think what I would say is that 2021, was not won in 2021. It was from 2016 all the way. So, and multiple, multiple actors coming together, making sure that every time there was something to fight, it was fought. There was litigation, uh, which mostly we lost, but it taught the it showed the public what was happening and the conversation um, went on. And so that I think is what I would say about Zambia. Wow, thank you so much, Laura, for that masterclass on, on recent events in, in Zambia. I think you touched on an incredibly key point that we actually wanted to draw out today, and that is, you know, the power that civil society has and the crucial role that they play in maintaining political space and, and keeping the pressure on democratic institutions or so-called democratic institutions to work independently, even when things appear to be increasingly bleak as they were. Uh, during the Lungu era in, in Zambia. And of course, that increases the prospects that a transfer of power is possible because large numbers of people then turn out to vote, as, as, as you explained. I do have a follow-up question for you. So maybe just put this in your back pocket because we do have to move on because we're running, running short of time. But just in the back of your mind, perhaps this will come up in the Q&A. Um, you know, what are you doing now to ensure that this becomes the norm in Zambia? You mentioned all the work that went up um, in the lead up to the election in 2021. So how are you working in your colleagues in civil society to maintain that pressure? But with that said, right now, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Nick Cheeseman, because some of our, our speakers have to go. Um, and in today's discussion, Lise Reichner, to get their reactions and also to respond to the many questions we received through our WhatsApp and on social media. So Nick, with that said, uh, over to you. Thanks so much, Jeff. And I completely agree. You know, one of the risks we sometimes see, of course, in elections is you get an opposition victory and then civil society gets sucked into power because they've been supporting free and fair elections and developed alliances with the opposition. And then you lose the watchdog. So I think that question of how does civil society stay independent, not get sucked into power, safeguard the next election that you post to Laura is great. And Laura, please do come back to that in a minute. It was also really great, Laura, to hear you talking about the importance of kind of democratic memory. You sort of talked about muscle memory. I've also talked about that in some of my publications, you know, the way in which once you know you can get rid of a dictator, once society has achieved that, that becomes something you can fall back on, even when it's hard to communicate, as it was during the last Zambian elections. And of course, a lot of countries that we're talking about today, you know, Angola, et cetera, Uganda, have never had a transfer of power. That's never been achieved. And I think that is a, a really important thing that we could perhaps come back to in the Q&A. But right now, I'm going to be quiet because we have someone much better qualified than me to lead the discussion now. Uh, my fabulous colleague, uh, Professor of Political Science, University of Bergen, Lise Wagner, also one of my favorite people, um, but someone who's done a lot of work, not only on elections and election rigging, but on civil society and on democracy and in countries like Zambia, but also someone who's got a wonderful project at the minute on Breaking Bad, which is all about the backlash against democracy in Africa. So Lisa, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the Resistance Bureau. Tell us a little bit about the Breaking Bad project, and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on what we've seen from uh, our, our panelists so far. Uh, to the panelists, uh, there are questions already for you in, uh, for some of you, in uh, the discussion. So, uh, Martin Fiuli, there's a discussion, a question for you there, and I'll pose that to you in a minute. Uh, once we've had a few remarks from Lisa, and we'll be coming to you first. So, Lisa, over to you for a few reflections before I read out some of the questions from our audience. 
Thank you so much, uh, Nick, but, and thank you most of all for an incredibly inspiring discussion. And I've, I, I just feel like I, it's been so rich and I've learned so much from listening to you. So I think I want to get back to the Breaking Bad project, but I think I want to start with, I think, one thing that David said. David, you started off by saying elections mean nothing. Well, I'm going to dare to disagree with you because from everything I've heard now, is that elections is everything. Elections means everything to the, the people involved. That is, and it means everything to uh, the Musevenis, to the MPLA, because they have no intention of losing and they cannot afford to lose elections. So then the key question is why hold elections? Well, there are a lot of good reasons for holding elections even if you have no intention of losing. One of the thing is, uh, obviously, it's a very good way to, you know, every fifth year to, to connect with your people, to hand out patronage, you know, to, to shore up information about your people, and not least, of course, not to become par sort of a pariah in, you know, in terms of in, in international circles. But it's also a really good way of sort of, uh, changing leaders at the lower level. So research tells us that there are a lot of good reasons for holding elections, even when you have absolutely no intention of losing. And here's the thing, and just to repeat, or to sort of follow up from what, what Nick said, the problem in Uganda, the problem in Angola, the problem in the Congo is like, there should be democracy. Because the young, I mean, you have, enormously young population. And there is economic growth. There is also an incredibly sort of growth of social media. And, and the young people, they don't fascinate with 80 year old men leading in a country where the medium age is 15. Why would you resonate with leaders in their 80s? So here's the thing, when you have never, when you don't have a memory of an election actually generating change, it's, it's really hard to envision. And I think that is, this is the key. This is the key for these, I mean, the, the, if to use Laura's term, uh, these are not toddler dictators. These are super savvy and quite experienced senior dictators. And to, so how in these situations can, you know, the opposition be sustained? How do you, I thought the one thing you said, David, that sort of resonated with me, we go into elections every five years, not necessarily because we think we have a chance of winning, but this is our way to mobilize. And this is our way to connect in, a, you know, in the democratic game with our people. I thought Oral's comment about how the opposition in Angola were the one who took responsibility for peace. I thought that was also something that really struck with me. But I think one of the stories that, you know, that Laura tells that could be told from Kenya and from Malawi is that once you have a memory of one having one, there is, you know, there is something to fight for. Because it's also a question of how to sustain an opposition, you know, how to actually, you know, how to sustain an opposition year after year. And what do you have to, to offer your people? So I think one of the things that none of you talked about that I sort of, actually some of you, allude, uh, David, you actually alluded to it. It's the role of the international actors. Because I think this is something we probably need to talk more about. And it's also something when I talk about uh, sort of a backlash against democracy, I'm always saying that the backlash against democracy is not really because democracy necessarily is, you know, it, it's not necessarily because of the, uh, the, the, act, the sort of democratic actors in a country. The backlash is a lot is how the international donor community is withdrawing from, you know, from this field and okay. how the don you know, international donors are more and more willing to work with autocrats and they don't, they, it's almost like they've given up or they, they don't see, they don't no longer see the real point of fighting for democracy. This, really worries me and and this is something that i think it's something 
that may will make it more difficult to sustain the fight for democracy. And uh, just to give a few, the last scene since you asked me to talk about uh, the Breaking Bad project, and Breaking Bad here means backlash against democracy. And I think here, one of the, the key mechanisms that we find that everything you've said today, everything that's been said really resonates with, is that by all parameters, the African continent should see much more democratic gain because of the youth, young population, because of economic gains, because of civil society, and not least because of social media. What we do see, however, is that savvy, uh, <laughs> you know, senior dictators, not toddlers, have become incredibly good at using institutions to stay in power. They use the law, uh, you know, as for instance, COVID regulations, party laws, what have you, and they legitimize their hold to power through the law. And they also use their international relations very savvy. For instance, by saying, you know, when international actors get involved, oh no, no, they are, you know, we need to protect our sovereignty. So uh, international actors coming in to try to uh, sort of encourage democracy and encourage opposition are very often slapped in the face with the saying, how are you to interfere in our country? This is going against the sovereignty of our country. And, you know, with new actors becoming more and more important, Russia, China, and so forth, this is making it more difficult to sustain that sort of pro-democracy stand of the donors. I'm going to stop there and I'm just going to say this I this was an incredibly inspiring discussion and thank you all for great into great presentations. Brilliant. Thanks, Lisa. I think that's really important that reflection on the international community and also uh, your points there about you know leaders manipulating the law, right? What we sometimes call as lawfare and actually you know making the law for authoritarian and sort of in that sense manipulating the institutions from within is also key i know that uh honor manifalu has got to go soon so i'm going to go straight to you for our question and then we'll go through the rest of the panel uh so the question that you asked really is about the influence of joseph kabila and a suggestion that kabila and his allies you know supported security to maintain influence in politics and were you successful in that in terms of manipulating the election but continue to exert influence in politics today. And so I think the key thing that, you know, that this uh, questioner is asking is, how do you resist that? How do you go about preventing Kabila and other political figures and groupings from continuing to collude and interfere with the true democratic process in the DRC? Over to you. Yes, you're totally correct. Uh, Kabila is still there. Kabila has still influence. Kabila and Chisekedi equal one, they are together. Kabila appointed Chisekedi, and Chisekedi is working with Kabila together. And everything Kabila has set up, has put in place, uh, uh, is still there. Kabila is the one who brought M23, that rebels from uh, Rwanda, and M23 is there. Kabila is the one who colluded with uh, Kagame to destabilize uh, Congo. Kagame is still there, and the Kagame uh, and the Chisekedi, Kagame and Kabila sent Chisekedi to the Eastern African community. Kabila uh, is there and uh, he's doing his business. He, he has his people and uh, uh, Kabila, Chisekedi is paying a lip service to everybody, trying to react or to uh, behave as if he has a problem with Kabila. But what we are doing, we, we are educating people to tell people that, okay, we have to uh, see what is going on and to prevent another electoral fraud, because we want to have a uh, legitimate institution with legitimate uh, leaders. We have to have those guys who can really manage that country, prevent corruption, and prevent the sale of the country to uh, all those guys coming to uh, do business. That's why we are asking uh, the US. The US has pledged already $23.5 million uh, for the uh, incoming election. We are asking the US also to request to ask for the 
impartial election, the credible election. We are asking the US and the other countries that they have to do what they can for all stakeholders in Congo to meet, to sit, to discuss principle, to discuss rule, how we can have that impartial election. How can we correct the electoral commission? How can we correct the electoral law? I think because the US has put its reputation by you know, pledging that $23.5 million, the US has pledged its reputation uh, uh, sorry, the US has put its reputation on, uh, you know, how to call it, uh, if, if the election goes wrong, I think people will point the US. The, uh, you had the Secretary of State, Blinken, going to Congo. He didn't talk much on election. It looks like it is a kind of people are making complacence by dealing with the uh, those who are there because they have to prevent I don't know what. What we are uh, uh, asking is uh, we need fair, free, and impartial election. And we really think that the uh, uh, international community can work on that. Not only when we say international com community is not only Europe and America and Canada, but is also the African Union. We want also African the country like South Africa. In South Africa, the elections are all, 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 almost correct. The country, you have many countries, uh, you have a good election. And those uh, democratic persons in Africa, they have to intervene, they have to act. If not, uh, we will uh, uh, have a problem in, uh, in the continent in Congo mainly. And the Congo is a country with nine uh, in neighboring countries. And uh, Congo had to, has today 110 million people living there. You have a country like Congo Brazzaville with 5 million, Angola with less than 40 million, Zambia and so on. And if you see the situation going on now in Congo, the security issue, that security issues, as I said, started with Kabila. And that uh, if the security con insecurity continue, and uh, what Congolese will do if poverty continue? What poverty, uh, what Congolese will do? Most of them will go to Angola, to Congo Brazzaville, to Zambia, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the world will be destabilized. And also, the consequences what? And uh, all those minerals, the forest, will be used by those who don't uh, respect democratic rules and it will be disaster for all world, for the, 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 the planet. Thank you so much. That's a great answer. And I think it's very true, as Jeff said, that you know, one of the things we have to get away from is this idea that you know, we promote stability somehow by allowing people to rig elections. What we generally do is not promote stability, but store up future crises, because we don't allow you know, the people to have the leaders that they elect. So I think that was very powerful. David, I'm going to come to you. Now. Sorry, and and sorry, and I totally agree with Elise when she said elections means everything. We should continue with election and the force as force for credible and impartial election. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time today. I think actually that should be the title of our next book, Lise. Elections mean everything. Um, David, we're coming to you next uh, for a question you've been asked here. Again, this has come in uh, via our audience. So thank you to the audience for sending in questions from around the world. David, do you think it's possible to win an election before Museveni stands down? Will his standing down and the transition be the critical moment for the opposition whenever it comes? And are you doing anything now to reach out to the military to try and build links so that when there is a transition, they see you as a less of a threat? Over to you. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to reiterate and agree. And like I said in my earlier remarks, that uh, General Seven is trying so hard to you know, make people run out from elections, from democratic means and everything. But we believe in democracy, we believe in the rule of law, and we believe that elections are the best and the most legitimate means through which uh, people should come to government, 
and uh, the citizens should have a right or power to remove leaders who they don't want. So, so that's our philosophy. We believe that elections are everything. What I was trying to talk about was uh, what General Seven has literally reduced elections into. Uh, if you ask an ordinary citizen of Uganda about elections, their view is very, very different now from what it was maybe five, ten years ago, because uh, every successive election means Museveni tries so hard to make it mean nothing. And, and so people go to the polls, uh, they wake up very early, line up, when they actually know what the answer is. And it doesn't matter what they put in the box. At the end of the day, General Museveni with his electoral commission and the military simply will announce whatever they want. So our demand, of course, has been we want to have an opportunity as a people of Uganda to have a free and fair election. That's, that's our demand because that's what we are fighting for. Um, so that uh, the, the rights of the people are, are respected, the right of the people to choose the leaders of their choice. Now, to your question, I think I already explained that I, I don't think a solution under the circumstances, I mean, an election under the circumstances of Uganda as they are presently can actually be the solution to uh, this regime. We have been using elections mostly to mobilize our people because like I say, during, um, even you see during election time, the regime really, really makes it difficult for you to reach out to the people. How much more when it is not election time? So every time we want to try to do radio stations, go out there, they don't allow us to do that. So, um, that that's the challenge we have to deal with. So many times we've been looking at elections as means through which we can mobilize or rally the population into action, uh, which we believe action will then be able to lead to uh, substantive change. Um, of course, uh, we, there are many scenarios that can happen in Uganda today. Um, Genome 70 uh, has been in power for 37 years now, uh, in, in a few months, 37 years. He's growing old, clearly putting his uh, son in the pipeline for succession. Uh, a few months back, he saw his son uh, carry out birthday parties everywhere across the country. So we have, like, like many people in Uganda, uh, we, we are looking at many, many scenarios that uh, can happen that will potentially lead to transition. But what our role has been is to rally the people, to tell them not to accept a monarchy, Uganda is not a monarchy, it is uh, a republic. The people must have an opportunity to choose leaders of their choice in a free and fair election. Now, finally, to the question of the military. The military, like many other institutions of government, actually many of those people, like every other Ugandan, they believe in change. And they've been reaching out to us, many of them in different ways. Of course, there is a gentleman, um, a soldier who uh, in 2020 decided to come out openly, can put on a red beret and for the military courts and testimony and all that. So many gym. But as far as we know, there are many generals, um, many uh, mid level officers, and you know, millions, I mean, uh, thousands of people at the lower ranks who are pro change, who believe in change. Uh, and, and they've been reaching out to us every once in a while. Um, you, you know, when you see uh, the millions of people on the streets uh, in, in, uh, in, in the different districts of Uganda who support uh, change, some of them belong to the military, others are teachers, others are, so, so they are, the military is not detached from the problems of our country, uh, the, the, the huge debt levels, the high cost of living, the corruption levels, the intimidation, harassment, the unfair promotions within the military, um, you know, the lack of systems and institu institu institutional uh, clarity, and all those issues affect uh, people who are in the military. And uh, so uh, this was support, and we've been trying to reach out to them. Good enough, our leader, uh, President Chagulani, is a singer. He has been singing uh, messages uh, uh, to them. For example, in the last election, our election, one of the promises we had in our manifesto was that uh, uh, the lowest ranking police officer or military officer would start getting a million shillings. And in turn, we demand of them to also treat citizens with dignity and all that. And um, uh, so the, the, the regime operatives came out and bashed us, said this is not impossible, not possible to do. But that message went to the military, 
Now this year, General Seven has come out to say that he's going to implement that policy, and 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 so you can see that our message has a strong, strong impact with the military, and we deliver the right time they will be able to join the people of Uganda. Thanks so much, David. That's really interesting to hear. Um, so just to wrap us up, after what has been a really brilliant discussion, Laura, again, uh, we're going to come to you last, but certainly not least. Uh, we have the question that sort of Jeff posed to you and also, of course, the things that Lee's brought out based on your comments. Uh, we're afraid we're running out of time, but uh, you get the final word. So over to you. Um, thank you. So what are we doing to ensure that um, we keep our democracy healthy, at least our our electoral democracy healthy. And um, I think that the next five years are about concretizing that democracy and realizing that what happened in 2011, 2011 and 2021 can happen again and easily happen because of our weak constitution and I think uh, other pieces of legislation. Legis um, so what we are saying as civil society is that unless this government amends the constitution and also repeals laws like the public order act that were well used uh, have been well used by a number of the fact by just about every government uh, gives access to information ensures that institutions of democracy like the, like the judiciary parliament uh, uh, even the anti corruption commission are given real freedom re real independence and that real independence is financial you know they should they should have an allocation straight out of parliament as well as maybe appointments that are not made by the president so in zambia the president appoints everybody and their cousin ultimately because it comes down you see it, the president appoints the pss who appoint the boards who appoint everyone so ultimately the president is extremely powerful and what has happened before is that presidents have felt uh, that maybe they are, they are uh, benevolent. So we had President Manawasa before who refused to amend the constitution and is largely responsible for what happened after him. While he himself was a democratic president largely, he refused to make to concretize democracy. So we are hoping, and I'm hoping that in the next five years, civil society does not take its foot off the pedal and insists that our democracy is concretized via legislative and constitutional change that ensures that whoever comes into power afterwards is held by the constitution and, and held to account and controlled by the constitution. Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. As so often, you are, are an inspiration. And we're out of time, but I think I'm pretty sure that our, our viewers are going to allow us to have gone a little bit over today because the discussion was just so rich and just so important. Thanks, uh, Lise, for being a brilliant discussion. And back to Jeff and Mantade to wrap up the show. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I think I did would have loved to just continue with this conversation because it's very critical, especially for upcoming elections in places like Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Dira Congo, Liberia, and Madagascar. And there are plenty more that are coming up, but time doesn't permit us and we'll have to bring the show to a close. So first of all, just a special shout out to our panel. I think you did an amazing job. You taught us so much and there's so much engagement around the, to uh, the topic, which kind of just gives testament to the amazing contributions that you brought to the panel today. So we'll definitely keep in touch with all of you and find ways to make sure that we continue to spotlight your work. And obviously thank you to our audience because you showed up and gave us your time. So we appreciate that. And also just thank you for the engagement for, um, on, the, on the social media platforms. Um, for you to stay, to stay in touch with us, please visit our website, which is www.theresistancebureau.com. You can check out some of the shows that we've had before, but also be on the lookout for future shows. So you can actually subscribe on our homepage to get updates on the program, as well as to get just show summaries and participants' videos that we do outside of this program. On our website, you can also revisit, like I've said, um, past shows, which all, all of them are saved on our platform. They're available on, the, on our YouTube channel, as well as um, as podcasts. You can also search for us on every podcast to download our shows, so you can listen to, um, to those anytime. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube, so definitely check us out and find out what we will be doing outside the 
dedicated shows that we do. As a final note, obviously, shout out to our team at the Resistance Bureau. We have an amazing team that actually works with us. Um, so you normally see just Nick, myself, and Jeffrey, but there's an amazing team that works with us to make sure that the show is like sex. So thank you so much, Peter Dory. Thank you so much, Ndona Msara, for the behind the scenes work that you do. And like I say, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate the time. We appreciate the effort of our of our guests and just the level of engagement that came out of this. We look forward to seeing you in the future shows um, that we'll be hosting as the Resistance Bureau. Goodbye. Okay, everyone, we are off the air. Great show, everyone. Hey, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Laura. Fun. This was fun. All right. I'm gonna have to run and then but this was fun. I'd love to love to be back at some point. Okay. Yeah, I wish I wish we could have done a separate show with each of our speakers. It was all really, really incredible. And thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lise. Really appreciate it. But I you know, an idea for an